So I was asked to come here and speak today about how we blend things together on our operation near Bismarck, North Dakota, and th think of our farm as an ecosystem. So what do we have in common? You know, what does a rancher from North Dakota have in common with a farmer in Iowa or Pennsylvania or Washington or Canada, no matter where you're from? What do we have in common? The answer, of course, is soil. You know, I'm blessed in that I get to spend about six months out of the year traveling all over the world talking about soil health. And I can honestly say that no matter where I go, I'm 100% confident that the principles that I use to get our ranch to be an ecosystem in North Dakota are the same as they are no matter where I'm talking. You know, I often tell people when, when I come to a group and they'll say, yeah, it works in North Dakota, but it won't work here. No, it will work on your operation. The principles are the same anywhere. The tools may be a little different that you use, but the principles are the same anywhere. Now, a little bit about our operation. Uh, our ranch is about 5,000 acres located directly outside the city of Bismarck. Uh, it was the ranch was founded by my in-laws in 1956. We get about 15 to 16 inches of total precipitation. 10 to 11 inches from rain and the other four to five inches is from the 70 plus inches of snow that we normally get. When my in-laws farmed it, there's about 2,000 acres of cropland, it was heavy, heavy tillage. And they farmed it half crop, half summer fallow. So, and the crops were all small grains, primarily spring wheat, oats, and barley. A lot of tillage, synthetic fertilizers, some pesticides, some fungicides, and the land lay fallow every other year. All monocultures. Now, I was very fortunate in 1991 when my wife and I bought that operation from them that we did some baseline soils work. NRCS came out and they did some infiltration tests. What they found is we could only infiltrate a half of an inch of rainfall per hour. Now much of the rainfall we get in our location is in late May, June, comes as thunderstorms. We might get two to three inches in a downpour. Well, I was losing most of that. It was running off. It wasn't infiltrating into the soil. Now NRCS also did some soil testing and what they found on our cropland, organic matter levels were only from 1.6 to 1.9%. Now, historically speaking, soil scientists tell us that in that area of the Northern Plains, we should have been in the 7 to 8 percent range. So in other words, we had lost over 75 percent of the organic matter in our soils due to the farming practices. Now, our grazing system, we have a little over 3,000 acres of grazing land in perennials. 2,000 of that is true native rangeland. To our knowledge, it's never, ever been tilled. Then another thousand was cropland at one time that has been put back into perennials. When my in-laws farmed the operation, they could run about 65 cow-calf pairs and 20 yearlings is all on those acres. It was season-long grazing. We'd calve in the corrals, cattle would get moved out to those pastures, graze in, on them the entire summer. Then they might run on crop aftermath for a little while, and then uh, they'd be fed hay six plus months out of the year. I really came through the 90s to realize that I had degraded the resource. And through tillage, my topsoil was eroding. The organic matter was leaving. Ray Archuleta said it best when he put this slide together, and I hate to give him too much credit, but it's true. When he, he titled this slide, this soil is naked, hungry, thirsty, and running a fever. And I realized that was what I had been doing with my operation. And I had come to accept that degraded resource. As I said, when I travel around the country and around the world speaking, I get people that say, yeah, but you don't understand. This is our soil type. No, you don't understand. You have come to accept the resource you have. It's degraded. And I can honestly say I have never, ever been on an operation anywhere that's not degraded, including my own. We all need to think of regenerating our landscapes. Now, there's many symptoms of a degraded resource, and I just put some of them down here. 
I don't care which one it is, that's just a symptom. That really isn't the problem. So you can think of what fits your operation. In my mind, the current production model is all about killing. I tell people I used to wake up every day trying to decide what I was going to kill that day. Was it going to be a weed, a pest, a fungus? I also contend that we've killed our diversity, we're killing our soil, and in so doing, we're killing our profit. I didn't, didn't have the projections for Ohio, but I did find these projections, projected crop returns for the major crops in North Dakota this year. Boy, that really makes you want to farm, doesn't it? Every single crop, they're projecting a negative return. I had to look at another way of doing things. And the way that I found that works best is nature's way. Look at how nature operates. In nature, there's no mechanical disturbance. We can all agree on that. That's fact. In nature, there's always armor on the soil surface. Nature tries to cover herself, as Ray said. That's why the, if you go out and have bare fallow, you're going to get weeds coming. Nature's trying to cover herself. She's trying to protect the soil surface. Nature cycles water very efficiently. Through our farming practices, as Ray showed, we've destroyed that water cycle. We need to heal it. In nature, there's living plant root networks. And that's, those networks are very efficient at cycling and moving nutrients via the biology. Also, I get really upset when we consider what we're doing in farming and ranching today is conventional. I argue this is conventional. Nature has been around for thousands and thousands of years. That's the model we need to emulate. So I was fortunate enough that I had a group of scientists come to the place about a year and a half ago. And they decided to look at four operations, mine and three others. All these are in very close proximity, all the same soil types. And they're in such close proximity that I guarantee you the rainfall does not, is not much different. We're going to take a look at those four. First operation is an organic operation. Now, this operator, to his credit, is very diverse. I mean, he grows corn and spring wheat and winter wheat and barley and oats and soybeans and dry edible beans and alfalfas and clovers. Very, very diverse operation. No livestock, but he tills. Now, it just so happens the year that, uh, that the scientists were there, three of these operations grew sunflowers. But take a look at that soil. You see how it's crusted, how it's capped on the soil surface? How's water going to infiltrate in there? The infiltration tests on this producer's operation showed that we could infiltrate about 0.6 tenths of an inch per hour. Okay? That's it. You can see how the horizontal breaks in there from the tillage. How are plant roots going to get down into that soil profile? How's water going to infiltrate? Organic matter levels on this soil were about 1.6%. Second operation was, he considers himself a no-tiller. I'd call him a minimum till because he does have points on his cedar. He also applies anhydrous in those points. Very low diversity. He only grew for 35 years. The only two crops this gentleman grew were flax and spring wheat. That's it. Just keeps rotating. This photo was taken uh, in, in the fall of, 19, uh, of 2015. He had seeded spring wheat on this field. May 22nd, we had 45 inches, uh, uh, 40, excuse me, three and a half inches of rain in 45 minutes, washed his entire spring wheat uh, a crop away, and he had to plant sunflowers. I told my son, see, that's God's way of making him get diversity. You know? <laughs> so he did plant sunflowers. You look at this soil, the same conditions exist. Crusting on the soil surface, horizontal breaking. If I back up, if this allows me to do that, you would think those were the same two soils, same field, correct? Not much difference. Infiltration rates were slightly better at about seven-tenths of an inch per hour on this field. Organic matter levels were pretty much the same, one and a half to 1.7 percent. 
Okay, third operation. This operator, large operation, almost 40,000 cropland acres. Medium, what I call medium diversity, corn, sunflowers, malting barley, spring wheat, soybeans, no cover crops, no livestock. High, high use though of synthetics, fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides, seed treatments. Take a look at that soil. That's 20 plus years no-till. That's the poorest soil we looked at. It is like a brick. The high use of synthetic fertilizers has destroyed that soil. Infiltration rates were the poorest they measured at less than a half of an inch per hour. Organic matter levels were about 1.9%. Look at that. That's 20 years of no-till. And yet I talk to many, many no-till groups that say, I'm a no-tiller, I got it figured out. Really? Really? Fourth operation was our operation. We've been no-till 100% since 1994. We have high diversity of our cash crops and cover crops, as I'm going to show you coming up. We integrate livestock on all of our cropland. We have used zero synthetics. By that I mean fertilizers, pesticides, and fungicides since 2007. We do occasionally use a herbicide. Now, Dr. Haney's going to explain this this afternoon, but I put this slide in there just to preface the following slide. Dr. Haney says that soil organic matter is the house that microbes live in. Water extractable organic carbon is the food that they eat. So on the next slide here, I'm going to show you the test results that Dr. Haney ran from those four operations. Look at that. That's pounds of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. There ain't a lick of difference between those other three operations. Okay? Now look at the bottom line, which is my operation. Zero synthetics added since 2007. For years, as I traveled around speaking, people would tell me, Gabe, your system's going to crash. You can get nitrogen out of the atmosphere, but you're going to run out of phosphorus, potassium, and your micronutrients. Really? Really? Then why do my levels keep increasing every year? Now, of course, technically, they're not increasing in the soil, but the, the amount available to the plants is increasing. Now, that final column on your right, that's water extractable organic carbon. And I'm going to let Dr. Haney explain all about it. But that's the food that biology eats. So you look at the amount that my soils have available as compared to the others, and you see how I'm able to get crop production, profitable yields, without the use of synthetics. As I said, I've accomplished that with zero added fertilities, microbials, foliars, compost, or any other input added to the system with the exception of seed and a small amount of livestock mineral. That's it. Because I'm simply emulating nature. It really is that easy. I went back here and I figured all my yields over the past nine years. On the left is my yields over the past nine years since I quit using those synthetics, on the right is our county average, okay? You can see that all the major crops I'm significantly higher than county average. And I'm able to do that at a low cost of production. These are my costs averaged over the past nine years for those four crops. That's cost per bushel. Corn a year ago last fall, locally dropped to $1.63 because of our basis. Because you just can't get uh, rail cars into North Dakota. $1.63, I can still make a few pennies. Now, not much. But see, I get real tired of people talking about yield. We have to start talking about profit. I'll take profit over yield any day. Okay, what about micronutrients? I so wish when I started moving down this path that I would have had the foresight to archive some of my soils because then I, I would have been able to go back and have it tested today to see the amount of micronutrients I had available at the time. 
This is data from a friend of mine in Australia, Colin Sice. He did have the foresight to archive some of his soils when he started. Look at all those micronutrients. This is the percent increase in all those micronutrients, both available and total, in the past 20 years since he's moved down a regenerative path. People say, oh, I can't, you know, I can't produce. I'm short of these micronutrients. Really? If we grow things and focus on healing our ecosystems, we can increase the availability of those micronutrients. On Collins' operation, organic carbon has increased over 200%. That's phenomenal. I get really tired about people talking about climate change. We can take care of that as producers if we move to a regenerative model because we'll put that carbon back in the cycle where it belongs. It isn't rocket science. We just have to grow things.